Hey guys, I'm Tim, I'm from Warrior Parker. I head up the online experience at Warrior Parker, so basically I focus on trying to make the process of buying glasses online as fun, as easy as possible. And today I'm gonna to talk about Warrior Parker in the context of the brand origin and how that narrative came about. And then once that story and brand uh, narrative came into focus, um, how we concentrate on things, growing the brand by doing things that people wanna talk about. So how did the brand start? Uh, started with a personal pain point um, four guys, when they went to Wharton School, uh, that's where they met. Right before one of the founders got there, he had lost a $700 pair of glasses by leaving it accidentally in the seat back pocket of an airplane. And uh, when they were getting together, just talking about different pain stories they had, uh, they wondered why do glasses cost as much as, as an iPhone? It didn't really make sense. Glasses have been around for 800 years. The technology really hasn't changed that much um, since then and just didn't make sense to them. And then they also saw that other things were being sold online too, everything from diapers to jewelry to high-end fashion to shoes and contact lenses. And they thought glasses could probably be sold online too. And when you think about how glasses are historically sold or how everyone in this room probably buys them, you could buy an eyewear-only brand like a Ray-Ban, Oliver Peoples, Oakley, Persol. Uh, or you could buy a fashion brand like Chanel, DKNY, Polo. And when you buy these glasses, you're probably doing it you know, at a store like a Lens Crafters Pearl Vision Sunglass Hut. And you can use vision insurance. So this is an example of IMED, the second largest vision insurance company in the country. Um, does anyone know what all of these have in common? Yes, they're owned by the same company, Luxottica. So that's where it dawned on them, hey, I think we know why glasses are so high, why the prices are kept so artificially high, because one company um, owns all of this. And uh, that's where the Warrior Parker story came from. It's like, what if we could sell directly to customers online at a fraction of the price, um, basically by cutting out the middleman? Um, and for every pair that we sell, we could also do good and distribute additional pair to someone in need. Um, we could take, hopefully, transfer billions away from these multinational corporations um, and transfer them to people like you or myself. And in the process, demonstrate that you could grow a brand um, that could be profitable, that could scale, and also do good in the world. How many people think that sounds like a good story to tell? Right. Uh, yeah, so this is the sort of brand hierarchy, where first and foremost, a lifestyle brand um, that offers incredible value and service and has a social mission. And it's not that um, the social mission is at the bottom because it's less important, it's that you have to do the first things on the list before that last one become true. So if people don't buy into your lifestyle brand or don't like the glasses that you're selling, don't think they're fashionable, you can't offer them that amazing, you can't provide them amazing value and that amazing service, and that won't fund your social mission. So everyone here raised their hand, so that was a good idea. And uh, so did GQ and Vogue. So when the company launched, they decided we're gonna launch in, uh, some credible outlets um, to gain awareness. And uh, GQ called them the Netflix of eyewear, and Vogue hit a week later. And what happened? Uh, well, after the first three weeks, they hit their first year sales targets. They sold out of their top 15 styles in four weeks, and then amassed a waiting list of 20,000 customers because they were basically out of inventory. And the other thing that happened was that this story, this narrative, really caught on, and a lot of other people liked talking about it as well. Um, so this is just all right in the beginning, just for the first couple of months. And Really what I'm illustrating here is that uh, the reason why Ward Parker has been so successful, um, especially in the beginning, is that really a lot of the success comes around telling good stories. And stories and storytelling is the oldest form of human, human communication, it's how we relate to one another. Um, and one of the things that I tend to think about is that Ward Parker operates in a bunch of different worlds. They operate in fashion, in, um, in uh, social enterprise, and in retail, and in tech. And sometimes, especially in the, in the tech world, um, we forget that we should be telling stories to our customers and trying to relate to people. And oftentimes, the biggest difference between two products that do essentially the same thing um, is the story that it tells to a customer and how people relate to it. And so now I'm gonna go through a few examples of how we did a bunch of different things along the way and how we decided, once we had that story, to grow our brand. Uh, the first is in fall of 2011, um, we wanted to be a part of the fashion uh, scene in New York, and the biggest way to do that is for, to be participating in New York Fashion Week. 
So near infection week, you can do um, you know, runway shows or a presentation. Uh, we did not have the resources uh, to do either um, in a very large scale. So what we decided to do was hold our own secret fashion presentation the day before fashion week started. And we found this great space in the New York Public Library. It's this great reading room. And we staked out these, and this, is, this reading room has all these huge tables on it uh, where you can go and sit and read. And we staked out the last two tables. We had our own employees sort of sitting there all day holding off those spaces. Meanwhile, we had invited uh, about 40 editors to meet us in front of the New York Public Library and not to tell anyone um, like that you were going there and what you were doing because we really hadn't asked the New York Public Library's permission to do this. <laughs> So, um, and then meanwhile, we had uh, about 20, 30 miles in the hotel next door, getting ready, getting done up. And at 3.30, we invited everyone in, and the models walked in, and everyone who was saving those seats in the, in the back of the room got up and left. And the models were carrying these bright blue books that you see here, and wearing glasses. And then they all sat down, and they opened up, and they started reading, or at least pretending to read. These are models, so I couldn't verify uh, <laughs> what they were doing. Uh, and then, uh, all the editors were going around, snapping pictures, running up, taking notes, looking at the glasses. And the security folks at the New York Public Library were kind of running around, trying to understand what was going on. But everyone was just reading, so it just looked like business as usual. Uh, so they were kind of confused as well. Uh, and it, it turned out to be a pretty good success. The next day, as basically everyone's ramping up, launching Fashion Week, every editor that was there wrote about us, um, from Vogue, Esquire, Women's Wear Daily, and on and on and on, uh, talking about how Warrior Parker did this sort of guerrilla hush mob uh, and stole sort of the thunder from Fashion Week that week. Um, so that's more on our press spent. But thinking about our customers, we try to be as transparent as possible. And um, one way is to try to share as much information as you can. And uh, for us, that meant taking a look at the annual report. So uh, end of 2011, big trend, infographics, personal data collection and sharing and mixing and matching information. And we thought it'd be fun just to put together a report uh, that didn't talk about financials like income statements and assets and liabilities, but talked about what bagels we ate and um, what glasses were popular in, in, in what state across the country, and just various random facts that um, were just fun and didn't really have much meaning. And we put it out in middle of January 2012. Uh, didn't really think much of it. Really just put it out as a thank you to our customers and say, hey, um, this is how far we've come. We did all these things last year, and it's because of you. Thank you so much. And what ended up happening was it got passed around the internet like crazy. It led to our three highest consecutive sales days in the company's history at the time. Um, and it really opened the doors to lots more customers and people hearing about us. And one of my favorite things, uh, this slide has some like, traffic and how some people are coming from different devices, and it has most popular misspelled keyword searches coming to Worry Parker. Because Worry Parker, when you first hear of it, uh, it doesn't really necessarily resonate. You don't know how to spell it. You come home and you're like, oh, I thought it was Worry, Worry like Warmly Parker or like Worry Porker. And my favorite is Worry Barker. And uh, in, we, we, had, we all thought that was pretty funny. In March, one of our colleagues was joking around saying, guys, this is really funny. I think we should do an April Fool's Day project on this. Um, like, we should just create a site that sells glasses for dogs. <laughs> and uh, we thought about it, and we thought, OK, like we have two weeks. We could probably pull this together. And sure enough, the next two weeks, April 1st, we're around, Warrior Barker, uh, glasses for dogs. And we had a photo shoot full of professional dog models. And those of you who haven't had the experience of working with human models and then dog models, professional dog models are incredibly talented, sophisticated, much better than human models. <laughs> They will do almost anything you ask them to do. Um, they won't bark back. They won't do anything. Uh, super, super great. So what happened here? Well, we sent it, sent it out. And for the first three days in April, Warby Barker had two and a half times the amount of traffic that Warby Parker had. <laughs> <laughs> now, you couldn't buy glasses on this site. Uh, but the real thing for us was like thinking about how many times are you exposed to a brand that sells eyewear, or any brand for that matter, uh, through an April Fool's Day site, or a Fool's Day joke. Um, and out of this, we realized, hey, uh, you know, there's tons of people at Warby Parker that have lots of ideas, and we should be harnessing them because it's all going to help grow our brand. And this is an example here. Uh, we had started opening retail stores, which we'll talk about in a little bit. 
And this one guy at Warby Parker, he's obsessed with pneumatic tubes. So pneumatic tubes are kind of those things that banks used to use to you know, shoot money across the way, or like Augustus Galoop would get sucked up in that pneumatic tube in Willy Wonka. Um, and he was like, hey, in our next door, can we please, please, please use pneumatic tubes to send glasses from like the basement uh, into our customers' hands? Um, and he like CC'd the head of retail. So I just took a screenshot of this. So now, every week at Warby Parker, when you fill out, we have this report that you have to fill out that talks about like, what you did that week, we ask this question. Uh, please list an innovation idea that will benefit your customers, your vendors, or your fellow employees. And everyone in the company, so right now there's about 200 full-time people, submit this. So if you think about it, over time, over the course of a year, about 10,000 ideas get submitted. Really good way to kind of harness ideas. Uh, moving more on the customer service trend, um, following what Will's talking about, we, of course, answer anytime someone asks help by us, on, no matter what channel it is. But we found we had a problem. How do you give an answer to something like this in less than 140 characters? So when you're describing how glasses look, it's very, very difficult. And one quick idea that we had is let's decide, let's maybe sh shoot them a video. Uh, open up your Mac, open up Photo Booth, quickly uh, fire it, say, like, hey, wear the glasses, show them, talk to them, 20 seconds. Quickly upload that to YouTube, grab that YouTube link, put it back into a tweet, and send it back to that person. Um, and what we thought was that, OK, like this person's going to watch it. They're going to get really stoked about it. And we're going to create a really great customer experience just one on one. What we didn't realize is that people are going to share it with their friends. Um, and then people are just going to watch these videos you know, just because they're interested. So now each video that we make has about, on average, 120 views. So if you think about um, a tweet response that normally would you know, just go to one person and get lost forever. You, know, you wouldn't think about it. Now we're creating this that kind of lives on uh, the second largest search engine in the world, which is YouTube. Um, and now we just started, we've, over the last 18 months, I think we've made about 2,000 videos. Pretty crazy. Um, the same thing was happening with our home try-on. So our home try-on program, you can order five frames to send to you for free to try on at home. And customers were posting them. And we realized is that when customers posted photos of them wearing the glasses, we, of course, would give them style advice and respond to them um, every single time. But we had trouble tracking it. Um, but we knew that when we could track it, um, we found that these customers who were posting would convert and purchase 50% more on average. So we thought, hmm, when we redo our box, our shipping box, let's put a hashtag in there. Let's uh, promote them to share a little bit more. And now we've seen about a 40% increase in just the last month of people sharing their photos online, asking us for style advice. And if you think about if 50% of people who share convert you know, at a higher rate, and 40% more are sharing their photos, it's pretty impactful. The next thing is thinking about how can you make something that normally wouldn't get talked about, talked about. And uh, this is something that we do every holiday season when we sell gift cards. Believe it or not, we sell a lot of gift cards during the holiday because people want to share Warby Parker with their friends and family. Um, but it's kind of boring to give someone just a gift card. So this year, we gave everyone who bought a gift card a Make a Snowman kit in addition to your gift card. So it's full of uh, a fake chocolate carrot. It's a white chocolate that's dipped in orange. And then a uh, fake piece of coal, um, three buttons, and a pipe cleaner. And then we included a hashtag on it, Warby Snowman. And here are some examples of the fun snowman people were making. <laughs> Even our UPS guy got in on the action. Uh, and of course, the dog is quite cute as well. Uh, this is an example of something where like, you, know, you took something like a gift card that would probably normally not be talked about, and then you were able to expand it and create more things for people to experience your brand with. Uh, another way of really trying to grow your brand is thinking about partnerships. Uh, this is an example that we did last year um, with the Man of Steel movie. And for us, it made sense. This is a huge, un, like, uh, huge movie. Um, it would expose us to a very large audience. And it also felt true and on brand to us. Uh, Clark Kent is the most iconic glasses wearer of all time. He was the original do-gooder. And everyone at Warrior Parker loves Superman. I'm even supporting the Man of Steel frames on my face. And we put this out here, and it got a ton of press. And we ended up selling out of these frames in less than a week, the whole entire set. But not every partnership has to be super huge. Uh, this is an example of a collaboration we did with a company called Ghostly International. They're an online music label. They've actually been around for about 15 years. They're based out of New York City. And we thought that you know, if you're a lifestyle brand, music is a big part of that lifestyle. And it makes sense to um, partner up with like-minded individuals. And we put this online, just one pair of sunglasses, launched it last summer. And our glasses sold out in less than 24 hours. 
Um, so it wasn't the biggest collaboration with the biggest audience, but it was something that really made sense uh, for both our customer bases. Another example would be uh, a partnership we did with uh, Pencils of Promise. I mean, not Pencils of Promise, excuse me, uh, Donors Choose. Um, and uh, a great organization ties into our social mission. And for every pair of um, sunglasses that you bought, you also got a $30 gift card that you could spend on Donors Choose's website uh, picking a project that you wanted to support. And this is a little different because it got customers a little more involved than they normally would, right? And kind of building on that theme and tying back to music, um, another example is Beck. So Beck came out uh, with this uh, project about a year and a half ago called The Song Reader, where instead of releasing an album, he released an album full of sheet music. And then it was up to you as the fan uh, to basically play it yourself. And we collaborated, made two frames with Beck, sold out of them, but then also held a contest where we told our customers, hey, take this song, make your own version of it, and then um, we'll pick a winner and fly you out so you can watch Beck perform in concert. And even our employees got in on the act, and there are tons of versions up there, everything from an 8-bit version to a folk to like a hardcore like death metal version to you know electro pop dance mix. Um, that version is mine. So actually, if you Google uh, Warrior Parker or Beck, Tim Riley, you can watch me and my version there. And so going back real quickly to um, what we were talking about earlier, when the company first launched, we sold off all that inventory. Uh, one thing that happened was customers called and said, hey, I noticed you're sold out of all your frames online. Can I come to your office and try some of them on? And the founder said, sure, by the way, you can come to our office, but it's not an office, it's my apartment. And the, kitchens are laid, and the glasses are laid out on the kitchen table. And just ask for Neil when you get to the doorman downstairs. Uh, and not thinking that anyone's really going to come. But sure enough, people did start showing up. And it was amazing, because this is another chance for you to connect, tell your brand story, talk to your customers, understand what they're thinking, um, and just make one more deeper connection with them. And I can't stress that enough about talking and meeting with your customers to really understand them. And so when we moved to New York City, we took part of our office and made it into a showroom and uh, slowly started telling people about it. And it was, over time, it grew and grew and grew to the point where on a weekend day, so on a Saturday or Sunday, we had 1,000 people coming to an unmarked fifth floor loft uh, floor uh, just to shop for glasses. Um, this, in turn, pissed off all the other residents in the building because it was a single elevator that opened up to the floor. And they complained to the landlord. And the landlord was threatening to evict us like every other week. Um, so then we thought, OK, well, maybe we can do something a little grander. Let's try a pop-up for six weeks in Soho. And we got the number one yurt company in the country to make us yurts. They're also the only yurt company in the country called Colorado Yurt Company. And we sold glasses through there. We then tried to all different things. Let's take this on the road, uh, try bikes, a little less scalable. Um, so then we said, OK, where well, we can get a little more mileage. Let's buy a school bus. Let's rip out the inside. <laughs> Uh, rebrand it, uh, build you know, beautiful shelving and leather seating, call it the Warrior Parker class trip, travel around to 12 different cities, and meet customers um, from every part of the land. And then if that wasn't enough, maybe partner with uh, uh, Seaplane, so the Standard Air. They take people from the Hudson uh, River to um, the Hamptons. And then we said that we did a partnership where everyone who took that plane ride got a free pair of Warrior Parker sunglasses. So all the, along the way, we were learning all these different things, and everything was building. Um, we basically iterated each time that we did one of these new ventures, and that led to this. About a year ago, uh, last April, we opened up our first retail store, our flagship store in Soho. And you can see it, it resembles almost like a giant library. There's these terrazzo floors, these beautiful reading lamps, uh, putnam ladders. Um, and no detail kind of goes unthought of. So in the back, there's an eye exam uh, board that replicates a, one of those old school train station boards that does the fluttering, the like that. And uh, there's one of those uh, train station boards in Philadelphia 30th Street Station where the four founders went to school. And we found, it's, we made a digital version of it, but we found an audio recording from a pen professor of the train board sound, and that is actually piped through. So when the eye exam board changes, you're actually hearing the audio from that 30th Street Station train station. Um, and we actually have one more store launching tomorrow. It's our latest one. It's on the Upper East Side. And going back to what I talked about earlier, those innovation ideas, we, able to, we got them. So now that our new store has pneumatic tubes, uh, courtesy of that innovation idea that came almost a year ago, 
We finally got them in, and now glasses will be passed uh, from the basement to the first and second floors to customers via Pneumatic 2. And uh, that's basically everything there is that we have for a growing brand for the last four years. Um, hope you liked it. Thanks, guys. Questions? Yeah. Right here. Yeah, so the question is, like, how do you minimize the mistakes that happen um, in anything that you're doing? I think the one thing that we try to do is start really, really small. So um, those Twitter videos, they could have bombed. They could have gone horribly wrong. So we decided, let's just try this. But one thing is you don't ask for permission, right? So in that case, we didn't ask for permission. Um, I just told someone on my team, hey, let's just try this for like two days. Let's see what the results are. So if you do it and it bombs in two days, Cool, like moving on to the next thing, rather than like work on something for months and months and months and launch it. Then you had like tons of resources sucked in because then you might feel like more on the hook um, to like keep it going and then making it worse. So a lot of times it's very very small bets, and that even goes from like a product perspective. So um, the glasses that I'm wearing was the first time we did a new material in the glasses, and it was a very limited collection. And we wanted to see if we could even just do that from a manufacturing perspective, or if customers liked it. Um, we thought that we got a really great response. And so then six months later, we were able to build a collection that used all those materials on a much larger scale. So a lot of times it's making very small bets that if they fail, they fail quietly. Um, and if they succeed, they succeed quietly too, but then they pave a path for um, you know, more people to see it. Cool. Who wants Warby Parker for their dog? Am I the only one? <laughs> I'll buy it. Cool. Um, one more. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, you get 200 innovation ideas a week. You're going to get probably 10,000 a year. And how do you prioritize and, and do all that? Well, first thing is that not all of them are going to be gold, right? Sometimes, you know, I, I got one innovation idea one time that said a couch. And it's like, well, that's not an innovation idea. That will make you more comfortable at work. But it's still uh, interesting. Um, the thing is that what, they, what we end up doing is they uh, go directly to the manager, the person in charge of that department, and then um, they can either like kind of put it in their backlog of things that they should be working on. Sometimes it's things that, um, that are being worked on, but they're not maybe not always 100% communicated because like across the department you don't get that collaboration. So it's actually a good like knowledge sharing and, and way to keep people updated on what's happening. Um, and the other thing is that they don't have to be these grand ideas. So like pneumatic tubes is probably a bigger type of idea. Uh, but sometimes they can be very small and implemented very quickly. Uh, and then you can just go from there. So not all of them, of course, get implemented. But it's just a good exercise and start thinking about it. And the idea is not to create 10,000 ideas. But even 50 of them, so like less than 1%, um, are amazing. That would, and you did one a week, that would keep you busy for a whole entire year. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.